I was wondering, uh, do you have a personal connection to the garment industry? Was there or people you knew, people in your family? Um, yeah. Um, my grandparents, my, my uh, grandfather on my father's side, uh, ran a um, uh, hanger and dress form business in Brooklyn. Uh, and it was my great grandfather's, and he immigrated. And in many ways, his stories, like some of the stories you see here, uh, he was a poor Jewish kid that made it here as a teenager. He invented, actually, and patented in uh, the early 19, um, I think around 1910, an adjustable dress form. And the company was Acme Dress Forms, and he did very well. So, yes. And, and, and the other side is that um, my parents. Um, my father refused to go into the schmata business. Uh, he ended up becoming a journalist, but both my mother and father became labor organizers. So they were on the other side. And my uh, father, my father-in-law, my wife's uh, father, actually worked for Sidney Hillman, was a union organizer. So I, like so many others, um, you know, when you look back, uh, you discover, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm connected to this story, too. For for a film that's that's kind of historical in nature, it had a kind of very personal feeling. That's why that's why I asked. Um, well, it's not just me. Or I mean, I I think one of the things that is just you know was an eye opener was how many people, mm -hmm. if you just scratch the surface, are in some way connected. And not at just in New York City. We went when we went to Toronto and opened the film there. I was stunned. I never realized the extent that there was a huge schmata business up there. Uh, so it's true. And Sheila Nevins, who is you know the um, uh, the head of HBO. Uh, nonfiction and a force in her own right. Um, I'll just tell you a little how it started, but then we discovered that she had a very profound connection that she wasn't even sure of. She'd heard stories in her family that her great aunt was in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And during the making of this film, Daphne Pinkerson, the producer, uh, did a lot of research and we got a, a, a historian and we were able to discover that Sheila's great aunt actually died in the Triangle Shirtwaist fire. She was one of the young women that jumped out the window uh, and died. We found the death certificate. Uh, so that, that, that became such a powerful force, not only in the making of this, um, we did a follow-up that'll be on HBO March 21st uh, and there'll be an event only two blocks away from here, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire literally happened three blocks from here in the Ash Building, uh, right off Washington Square. And this March 25th is the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, and it's going to be a major, major event in New York City. Uh, and we've done kind of a, a memorial film uh, that is all the story of what happened in Triangle is told through the descendants, through people who are somehow connected to all sides of that story. The genesis of this film was... I had, for years, kind of been on Sheila's case. When are we going to do something that speaks to the economy and how things are changing? And, you know, she would always say, you know, go to your friend Bill Moyers or go to Frontline. Yeah. That's not the kind of thing we do here. And then uh, in the summer of 2007, well before the crash, um, she said, maybe it's time to do something. Let's start looking. And I was actually looking in the hedge fund world because I have some cousins, some family in that world, and they were beginning to get easy about this whole subprime crisis, you know, and you could see there was the beginning of a panic. Uh, little did I think it would ever result in what it did. So I went to her and said, you know, I, I think I can get access to this world. No one's ever really been inside. No one understands. And she said, you know, hedge funds, you know, who cares about that? That's on the Bloomberg, MSNBC, CNBC. We don't do that. She says, what about the garment center? And I looked at her like she was crazy. The garment center, I mean, does it even exist anymore? I mean, is anybody even making clothes? And, and she started going, you know, looking at what she was wearing. This is made in India. This is made in Thailand. Um, and I said, well, you, you want me to do something on the schmata business? And she said, schmata, great title. And I said, uh, yeah, what's the film? She said, you'll figure it out. So that, that was literally how it started. In watching this film, you know, there's this, I mean, the, the rags to riches to rags story is one that's mirrored in, in the larger society. And, you know, it's, it's today it seems like, um, you know, for the last 70 years, people have been trying to repeal the, the, uh, the New Deal, you know. And, I mean, it's, you know, so we get to this high point for American labor and then, you know, for the next 70 years and till today and into the future, people are trying to basically 
take us back into the 19th century. Um, well, I think it's appropriate you, you, you bring that up, I mean, because tonight is the State of the State Union. Of the Union yeah. And then Mike Spence, who is, you know, very conservative, uh, fiscal uh, Republican. And then if that's not uh, conservative enough for you, Michelle Bachman is doing a, a Tea Party rant. Uh, so it's 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 actually, you know, began in the late 70s and uh, early 80s, you know, this push to deregulation. I mean, there were there were both political forces uh, and there were just uh, technological changes. You know, I mean, uh, the automation uh, um, uh outsourcing obviously that you could find cheap labor anywhere globalization and containerization uh, but deregulation was obviously a huge part that, that that the political will was that we have to liberate capital we've done enough for working people that was the new deal now we have to rebalance it and do more for capital um yeah so that's a huge question you know where we go i, I obviously think and, and and there's a line in the upcoming film the uh, triangle um remembering the fire where one of the relatives says you know you hear all this talk about deregulation you want to know what deregulation is look at these young women lying on the street just three blocks away in other words this idea that 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 business uh, doesn't need to be supervised, doesn't need to be regulated, that it will self-regulate, that the marketplace will take care of itself. I mean, how this myth has, has, has taken hold and has such power. And even after the crash of 2008, you know, here we are, you know, three years later, and we're, see we're hearing the same mantra, and it's like, we want more. Yeah. We want more. So, um, you know, that, that's obviously my own personal perspective. But, um, yeah, I think that that was one of the unique things about this endeavor was let's look at it through this different lens than you normally would. Uh, I could ask you questions all night, but I think some of you guys might have questions to ask. And you've raised your hand first, so. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because um, that was really, this is a musical, first of all. I mean, that's, that's, that's the secret to why it was on HBO, because it is a musical. Um, so it has a certain kind of entertainment and, 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 and showtime element. And John Zorn is a friend of mine. The guy's a genius. He went in the studio with a trio, and they just had a magic moment. And they came out with, uh, you know, 12 pieces. I think 10 of them are in, are in the film. And what Richard and I, this, this is kind of how it worked. It was a loop. Um, we would play that music. And that kind of started, it, it, it gave us a rhythm and, and, and a kind of texture, you know, that we started working off of. Uh, we would cut scenes to it. We would think, oh, you know, this suggests certain things that we didn't even have. We hadn't shot or archival material, et cetera. So uh, music was key. Now, Rhapsody in Blue, which obviously opens and closes the film, again, that wasn't just taken out of the air. That was played at Mark Jacobs. Um, incredible show that he had in uh, 2008, literally, I think, a day before the crash. It was at the Armory on 26th Street, and, you know, he, he, he did it up. But that was the song he chose, interestingly enough. Now, now, when Gershwin wrote that song, which was literally in the early 20s, it was very much about New York City, trying to capture in, in, in music uh, the kind of chaos and diversity of the growth of this metropolis. And it was literally at that time that, that he wrote that the, the Garment Center was being born. My point, music was key to the creative process in kind of a feedback. Yeah, some stuff you start with, it suggests other things. You go to an event, you know, isn't that interesting? Mark Jacobs, even in the clothes, which you see at the very end, the woman, you know, kind of wearing the the, the hat that suggested uh, some of the kind of style of the beginning of the 20th century, um, that suggests ideas. But I would say that music was essential and that I know John, you know, John appreciates the film, but I will admit he came up to me, he said, that's the last time I will ever, you know, score a film where there's anybody else's music in it. So I appreciate that he was open enough to allow us to mix his original score with uh, a lot of licensed music, you know, that carried us through the 20th century. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Mark, uh, for being here.